Hi, everybody. Thank you um, to our gauging, Paul and Robert, for inviting uh, Mark and myself here today um, to be part of your conference. And um, what do I just put I suppose myself and Mark are um, two social work managers from the Western Health and Social Care Trust, and we're based within the fostering service. And I suppose just to give you a wee, um, kind of map of where we are, we are the gold here over here so we kept we capture the whole western trust area from lima valley right down to enniskillen um, the top half of the western trust would be very um urban and um, with taken in dairy city the lower part is very rural um covering oma um, and enniskillen enniskillen area so it's just to give you a wee bit of geography around the Western Trust. The makeup of our, um, I suppose, for the service, and um, I'll start on this side. We have a fostering service, which we have a head of service, which is Pat Armstrong, Claire McKay is our service manager. I am the fostering recruitment and assessment um, social work manager for across the whole of the Western Trust. And I am um, mainly, my job would be to recruit mainstream foster cares and to assess mainstream foster cares but it's supposed to give to give me a wee bit of context around my job that's what i came in to do um eight nine years ago but the growth of kinship came into my post there was a lot of um kinship assessments came um to the fore during that particular time and in the last year suppose i have been then covering um, mainstream foster care and kinship foster care assessments and recruitment and assessments. And then in the last year, we um, developed kinship in the northern sector of the Western Trust. We have now a designated kinship team, which Mark is the manager for. I still, around the Oman and Eskillen area, I'm responsible for kinship. Um, we have a support and development team who um, support or approve foster carers like yourself Rose you would have a, a support and social worker from the kinship team or, or support and development team we have a specialist foster care scheme within our um, fostering service and we have two training coordinators to, to help coordinate training so i suppose within um, the our fostering service we are working towards a differentiated model and kinship is now part of that stream within the differentiated, differentiated model and Mark being the kinship manager for the northern sector of our trust. Um, Anna um, alluded to some of the, the legislation earlier um, in her presentation. So we work under the children's order um, in Northern Ireland. Um, volume 3 of the Guidance and Regulations, the Family Placements and Private Fostering Arrangements. We um, work under the Minimum kin Kinship Care Standards 2012 and they keep being reviewed quite regularly so um, and be kept updated and we work um, as they're revised um, around policies and procedures. We have the Care Matters um, document that we work with and we have um, the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child and the, P the European Convention of Human Rights for, for carers and our children. I talked a wee bit there um, earlier just about the, the growth in kinship care. Our stats can show, do show now at the end of March uh, 2017 when we collated our end of year stats that um, the, the kind of the blue purple colour there is mainstream, kinship is the, the red one and the green is private. So that is our foster care population and you can see the growth in kinship care. Um, there are, on, relating to that pie chart, we have 490 children currently in the Western Trust in foster, foster care services. 213 of the children are in mainstream foster care 254 are in kinship care and the 23 are in private foster care. Um, 
Kinship care has grown over the last number of years, but also the, um, the recruiting mainstream foster care is, is going down. We, we're finding it very difficult. And I think everywhere across Northern Ireland are finding it quite difficult. You can agree with that, Kathleen, that it's really difficult at this current climate trying to bring in mainstream foster cares. Hence, then we have the growth in kinship care, you know, as well. Um, and thank goodness for families coming forward to care for their children because um, we would be in a very difficult situation when we don't have um, the, the resources for within mainstream as well. Breakdown of um, our cares, um, kinship cares within the the um, the age brackets. We broke them down to have a wee look at them, and it's, and it has gone alongside the research that was shown this morning, um, both from uh, Kathleen and um, Marion, was it? Mandy and Anna's research that it is the older carers that are, are, are coming up um, that there's a lot you know there's a high percentage of the older carers so we have 18 um, to 30 age group we have 18 foster, 18 kinship carers for the 30 to 40 year age group 34 40 to 50 we have 53 50 to 60 there's 65 kinship carers um, currently at the end of March um, 2017 and 60 plus we have 33. So overall we have 98 kinship cares over the age of 50 years of age and that's 48% of our kinship cares are older kinship cares. And you know kinship care you know within our trust we do aim to keep families together and you know whether th this is now this breakdown is the formal arrangement. This is the formal looked after child where the child is in under the being accommodated or interim care order or a care order. And it does, you know, there, there is a fundamental difference between mainstream and kinship care because kinship care does straddle that gap between care by the, the birth parents and care by the state. So they've got their, their kin care in um, for um, the children. And a lot of them um, placements with the, the kinship carers um, here today, or, you know, with the stats shown, were made in an emergency basis. You know, it was through an emergency that the children were placed. Um, and, you know, there's no planning as such for that markets and we'll talk a wee bit about that process you know there you know we we have a we have processes a process around like viability um and then we have assessment and as such we'll talk a wee bit about that later on but there's no warning the children are just uh, you know placed immediately with either a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle but there's benefits there's benefits um, to the children living in kinship care. You know, it enables the children to live with the people that they know and, and that they trust. And it reduces the trauma for children um, when they're placed with people that, they are no, that are known to them. It reinforces the child's sense of identity and it facilitates children's connections to their siblings and to other family members. The kinship process and I suppose there's challenges for, for our um, carers going through this process because, again, it's not by choice. You know, they, um, they're brought into this situation um, that, that challenges them somewhat because there's a lot of assessment process. You know, there's a lot of paperwork to go through. So we have initial social work contact, which is, you know, um, where they are introduced to social workers from the field, they're introduced to ourselves um, from the fostering service, you know, to undertake a viability um, assessment to see are they viable to look after, you know, their own family um, member, um, and that has to be completed within 48 hours of the child being placed on an emergency or immediate basis, and then you have your assessment process. So ideally, you know, this situation allows for the children to remain with their, their birth family and to preserve family contact. But for many kinship cares, this is, you know, a new role and a, a new challenge for them. You know, especially, particularly, and, and Rose talked a wee bit about this, you know, 
when you've assumed their years of raising their own children and they think that's behind them and then they have to come back in to um, care for their own grandchild. Um, and the, the impact then of their own their own adult children's behaviour, um, they have to take that on board as well. And in my experience of working with um, kinship carers, and especially older um, kinship carers, we have to be creative. We have to have a multi-agency approach in assessing and supporting um, the placements. You know, carers don't always view, older carers um, don't always view the risks as seriously as what social services may, um, may assess the risk. And, you know, um, they don't intentionally intend to collude with their, their, their family members. But there's an emotional tie. There really is an emotional pull, you know, because they want to help their their family member, um, and they're very they can be very optimistic and saying, "Well, this is for the short term. I'll do this in in the interim until they get back on their feet." And and she'll only be for a wee while. And and that's not that's often not the case. It ends up to be a longer um, period of time. And then care, older carers especially, can become fatigued in the longer term, and, and that, uh, that, that's difficult. You know, we also find that through the process of um, the assessment that carers do come a long way. They're, they're, you, you do see a shift in, in, in the kinship carers, you know, and they have come to kind of a conclusion that, you know, we can't help our own child at the minute, their own adult child, for example, at the minute, and our priority is now the, the grandchild or, or the child they're looking after. So when such when these areas are examined and you know emotional conflict is you know I suppose examined more within the assessment, it gives the carers a better understanding and a better um, understanding of their own children's needs and their own grandchildren. Hello everyone. Um, just to carry on from where Dimna left on, I suppose from a practitioner's point of view, what I wanted really to tell in what we do is get the feedback from them. So when Robert contacted me, I went out and I spoke to a few carers to try and get a bit of feedback from them. Because um, what we try to do is understand, understand where we come from as practitioners and social services and the systems that we work in. But understand a lot of our carers have never experienced that before, you know, so their feedback was vital to help us, help inform us about how we move forward. So. I suppose I'm not going to be able to say this as well as Rose did, but this is the feedback I've, I've tried to capture from people. So um, some of the things they were saying. So I've always cared for my grandchild. What happens if I fail this assessment? You know, that's a massive thing to worry about when we go in as an agency. Um, and our first point of call is, can you look after these kids? But we're going to have to assess you. We're going to have to do this with you. And we want to make sure that you're safe and those, that kind of language. So we have to understand that could be really worrying for carers. Um, so people have touched on this already today. The relationship is critical. Um, somebody said to me, I'm now in the role of granny, mammy and daddy. I'm wearing three hats, you know, and if we think about that just for a minute, um, that's so true, you know. Um, the appreciation um, and thanks we have to give to these carers is, is you know, unbelievable. Uh, I've never had to have a social worker in my life before. There were so many professionals and meetings. Can I not just get on with it? And that's the message we get time and again. Um, and that's difficult. And we just have to appreciate that when we've got looked after children. That can't be the case. And um, social services are involved. Um, and they're involved for a reason. But it's understanding them when we're asking carers to uh, take on this role that we appreciate that and we understand that and we try and work with that. Um, I know the kids' needs are now the priority, but I can't, can't stop worrying about my daughter. I love her even though she can't stop. You know, real, real feeling and emotion. And we have to understand that. And sometimes our expectations are, you no, know, if they turn up at the door, then we expect you to phone the police. So we expect you to turn them away, you know, because of safety issues. But we have to understand how hard that is, you know, and we have to try and work with that and build up a relationship and that partnership approach and how we manage those situations. But the emotional pull is so strong to, you know, for our kinship carers. Um, 
when we were looking at age and health of kinship carers, the kind of things that was coming back was, the children keep me feeling young, you know, a lovely statement. Um, I worry about my finances when I reach pension age and how this will affect us. Just because my sight is not good doesn't mean I can't look after my grandchild. You know, and we have to be realistic. People feel judged. You know, we try and adopt a strength-based uh, assessment, you know, and we really try and focus on the strengths, and we want people to uh, appreciate that and understand that. Even though we do not keep the best, we want to keep the children in the family where they belong. Nobody can love them like we do, and that's a real consistent message that we get from family members and from carers. I don't understand self-employed, that HMRC keeps saying... I'm caring for my grandkids. We had a, a, a couple of grandparents who ended up receiving a phone call from HMRC to say they were in thousands of pounds of debt because they, they, they didn't have the information on how to manage that situation. And that's what they're having to manage on top of caring for the kids, you know. So as a practitioner's point of view, we have to listen to this. How do we make it easier? You know, that's the key. Um, home conditions and accommodation. My housing is best suited to us as pensioners, and we don't have enough room, but we don't want to be rehoused to keep the children. Um, accommodation can be really, really worrying for our carers. Um, I'm glad to hear that you didn't need a room each, because uh, that's not an approach that we take in the West. You know, rooms can be shared, you know, depending on gender and all those kind of things. Um, but accommodation can be a worry for people. Um, we had just an example of that um, a few years ago. We had a situation where grandparents took on the care of um, their grandchild, or two grandchildren, a grandson and a granddaughter, but the accommodation didn't lend to it at all. And see the, the very initial check, you know, in the viability visit, you know, accommodation can, can be a real nice factor. But we had, we had to look at this in, in its entirety. If these children didn't go to their grandparents, the chances, where was these two teenage children going to go? They were going to go into residential care. So there was a sofa and a sofa bed and we had to, you know, look at it in its entirety and go, what is the odds here? You know, what are the pros? What are the cons? So the children did remain with their grandparents. But, you know, that's the type of, you know, if, if you struck strictly to the to the guidelines, you know, we should have been saying that isn't a viable placement, you know. It's dilemmas, it's the yeah. dilemmas that we have to face and navigate our way through, and sometimes we have to go against the guidance and, and you know, work with families. You know, we've had examples of people sleeping on sofas in emergency situations, but emergencies become weeks and then months, and then, you know, when do we say that's not okay? You know, it's not okay for them as, as you know, a grandparent, it's not okay for the kids to be in those kind of situations. We have to work with these things, you know, as a practitioner. But it's listening to people is, is the powerful bit. Um, we have families who, who have lived um, in an area all their lives, and then the accommodation isn't suitable. And we ask the question, would you be prepared to move? And it's, you know, this is our community. We have our friends, you know, so we have to balance all of that up. It's not easy, but listening to our carers is so important. So as I just made a note there, there's powerful messages that we have to consider as practitioners. We have to think about our processes as social services and the journey that we ask carers to go on, and it's not easy. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to think about what is the impact, what's the impact on the carers, you know, what's the impact on the children. Um, what we find is it's not black and white. We have to work with grey areas you know, on a, on a regular basis. What are our expectations and are they fair expectations? So we have to question our practice all the time. Um, and we need to understand where our carers come from. That story, that journey to get where we are in these crisis situations, you know, we have to listen to that and, and, and support and work through it. Um, Dimna touched earlier, older carers can often feel a sense of guilt or worry about their adult children and the problems they're experiencing as parents. You know, so. It's not only taking on the role of caring for the kids, but it's thinking about the loss or, or those emotions that are there and that worry um, and how we're, we're asking them to, to take on both roles, you know, those, those hats. Um, we need to think about, you know, the experiences of them being parented. You know, we talked about how parenting has changed, you know, and when, when they were parents, um, things are very different now. We need to think about uh, 
child sexual exploitation, the internet, all those risks that kids come, come with now, you know, and a lot of our carers may never have heard of those things, it may be new to them, um, so we need to think about how we respond and how we support people with those kinds of issues. Again, this has been talked about an awful lot today, so I'll not labour. Um, was I ready for this? A lot of the time, it is in a crisis situation. From a practitioner perspective, we're trying to get better. If there are worries in a, in a family situation, we're trying to identify them early, so contingencies and assessments you know, are started before it becomes a phone call in the middle of the night, can you take these two kids? Um, because we recognise it is a big decision. You know, People have plans when they retire and those kind of things. Um, and that can all change. Um, again, a bit more feedback. So I'm the granddad, I have to do this. Um, it wasn't what we were planning, but it's the right thing to do. And what happens if I don't? Where will they end up? They could end up with strangers, you know. Really powerful messages that we have to listen to. Um, but then with that comes a choice, you know. So if they're taking on this role, what does that mean for them? And they need support with that. So the, the main dilemma is we need to take into consideration how kinship care occurs. Understand our kinship carers and their stories to help us support and make the right decisions for children. I'm going to be honest, I've only been doing working in kinship a year. It's not easy, it's not straightforward. Um, but it is about the, the ethos people have talked about, a partnership approach, recognising strengths that people bring, um, the skills, the qualities. Um, Sometimes it's not possible for us to get into kinship situations for specific reasons, but where we can, we should strive to do that. So what can we do? Well, as Michelle already touched on, we've started a, a partnership approach with Kinship Care. We have a support group up and running in the West since April this year, which we do in partnership, and it's, it's the Kinship Care support group. It's supposed to be what they want, um, and then we try and facilitate that. And today, that's been very successful. Um, and the feedback is people appreciate that time and space that you talked about earlier, Michelle. Understand the difficult difficulties kinship carers face. If we can't, if we're limited in social services, which at times we are because of resources or ever shrinking resources, <coughs> can we signpost um, fostering network, kinship care, you know, Whoever it may be, it's important that we give that information and, and are familiar ourselves. Uh, one of the most important things is to listen and advocate. The number of times kinship carers would be part of a lack process and say, I'm not listened to. They'll listen to the parents, you know, they'll listen, but, but I'm, my voice isn't heard, you know. So we have to be listening and advocating. Um, we have the statutory uh, kinship standards where we visit monthly. But what we try and do is more frequently if needed, you know, it should be based on need um, and what the carers, you know, appreciate and they do appreciate that support. Um, if residency is an option, then people should be supported, they should have the information. Um, I talked about the support group and then training. Um, lots of our carers don't want training. They say, no, I'm absolutely fine. What can you do for the kids? Um, but sometimes carers would appreciate and, and um, blossom with training, you know, so that should be made available and we have two trainers in the trust now um, who run training specifically and our kinship care do as well. I suppose it's about facilitating our older carers to come out to training. You know, some of our older carers mightn't even have um, the, the facility to drive to training, so it's about the, their, the support worker helping them with that as mm -hmm. well and, you know, it's just trying to meet the needs of the care in every way. And that's, that's, that's us. Thank you. Thank you.